Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Psychedelics Today. This is your host, Kyle Fuller, and welcome to another episode of Vital Psychedelic Conversations. Today on the show, we are joined by a good friend and colleague, Dr. Ito Cohen. Um, really excited to, to have this conversation with him. Um, but before we dig into uh, this, this episode, uh, just some reminders that if you haven't subscribed to the podcast yet, you can do so wherever you listen to podcasts. Um, it helps us out a bunch. And uh, if you haven't left a review yet, uh, consider doing so. That helps us out with algorithm and whatnot. Um, if you want to also support the show, a really great way to do so is by uh, sharing a piece of content on our social media. So make sure you're following us over there and just share what this podcast if you're listening to it and let people know that you're listening. Um, and then also, if you want to leave a small monthly donation, you can do so at patreon.com slash psychedelics today. Um, I think that's it. Ito, welcome to the show. Excited to have you here, man. Thank you, Kyle. I'm happy to be back. And it's always good to talk to you. Yeah, likewise. I think you've been on a few times. I don't know if you need an introduction, but maybe just a short little quick bio. Sure. Um, I'm Ido Cohen. I practice out of San Francisco, um, see individuals, couples, and do groups. The last nine years, I've been doing a lot of um, individual and group preparation and integration specifically for people who are coming back or going either before or after some a psychedelic experience. Um, started the integration circle, which we do, we invite people like yourself, like my good friend, Deanna, uh, who all three of us have done stuff together to do um, workshops about preparation and integration from different perspectives, either from like we were, did a thing on archetypes or uh, consultation groups for people who do ketamine treatments and who are psycho psychedelic therapists and other people who are psychedelic curious and want to weave that into their work. And yeah, just in general, really love working with people who are searching to explore their psycho spiritual world and either for healing or spiritual growth and excited to have this conversation and be part of vital. I think it's by far the most exciting project uh, that I've seen enter the psychedelic space. Oh, thank you so much. Years, really? Yeah, it's been it's been interesting to hear a lot of the feedback from all, either the instructors or students, um, a, a, just around the curriculum, um, and just how excited excited they are about it. And so, I mean, that's just always really interesting to hear, especially when there's like other programs around that people are, are very excited about it. So, I'm feeling excited and thrilled to be offering this program, and yeah, super excited to have you part of it. Thank um, you. Yeah. <laughs> So we kick off this series with a question, and that question is, what do you think is the most vital psychedelic conversation people should be having right now? Such a good That's question. That's a big question. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I think for me, it's that the fact that we, the need and importance to talk about what long-term care looks like as part of psychedelic psychotherapy. So how do we- Can you go into that? that a little bit more? Sure, you know, I think a lot about, um, how do we make sure that psychedelics don't become just um, peak experiences for people that then get shelved on some mental or, you know, create more distress or more bypass? And what are the what is the frame and structure and modalities we can start thinking about or we already thought about, it, but start implementing, experimenting with that really offer movement from peak experience to long-term sustainable change. Um, and I think, you know, for good reasons, the psychedelic research is so focused on the experience right now. Um, and we haven't given, in my mind, enough conversation and discussion about, well, what does this look like? How does this get integrated into long-term care? So people yeah. who do psychedelic psychotherapy there is, there is a longer integration or it's part of a longer process. Um, yeah, because it doesn't end in the psychedelic experience. Right. And I think like that's missing. That's the like, conversation that I feel is missing from the space a little bit. Yeah. I guess this is a two-part question. One is like, <clears throat> obviously you've been around for a while, so I'm wondering what observations or experiences have, have triggered this. Um, for you to want to focus on on this longer term piece, and then also, yeah, why, why, why aren't we talking about this a little bit more? <laughs> right? um, I'll start with the first, the second one. I have a lot to say about, but I think what's triggered this for me is working in the last year with you and Deanna and us doing a bunch of groups for providers, 
And one thing that I'm starting to see a lot is that um, even if it's for ketamine or people who go to retreats elsewhere and come back, um, there isn't the there is some kind of gap in people go and have these profound experiences, either, you know, like doing some trauma work or shadow work as we want to call it, or having like significant <clears throat> experiences, like spiritual experiences or psycho-spiritual insights. And they come back from that experience and they, they're, they're left either very inspired, but usually most of most people are, come back or are left with some sense of rawness and uncertainty and there's a lot to process and they're not sure how does it how does this fit with this and new feelings come up and um and they don't they don't have i I just heard in people that we work with they don't have the space to do it and there is also some refusal to turn it into a long-term process and you know that for, for me it's always been i'm you know i own my bias that i'm really focused my passion is in integration i really believe that it's some kind of prolonged process <clears throat> that really helps us move from peak experience to long-term sustainable change so my my mission has been okay how do what does that bridge look like what is that bridge between experience and the steps that we have to take to really, really integrate in a deep embodied way to move from, oh, I can become this thing or I have this insight to becoming the insight or becoming the thing, right? Like I heard this distinction between knowledge is what you know and wisdom is what you become. So how do we move from knowledge to wisdom in some way? Um and there is, and I think as humans in, in the culture we live in, we need, we need a frame for that. You know, I was thinking about our conversation and something that came to my mind is I've talked with a bunch of um, nutritionists who work in a hospital. And they said, you know, it's, and I heard from, they don't know each other, but I heard similar observation. They said, you know, these people will come with like severe illnesses and they're willing to put themselves in surgeries. But the moment I come into the room and I offer them like, hey, how about we rewire your diet? So it takes so much resistance. The idea of taking a practice and making it long term and the impacts it will have. And what do you mean I can't eat this type of like oily foods anymore and this and I have to eat vegetables? Like, no, I can't. And I think that's a great example of of what we need to deal with and talk about in the, in the psychedelic integration, which is. Yeah, it's, it's those long-term change of habits, of patterns, is where our psyche will start creating all these negotiations and, and pushbacks. And I think we, it's, it helps when there is someone who's walking with you in that process. And there is a space, a container, a, a path to bring to, for you to kind of have that process as, and to see that it's, very much tied to your psychedelic experience. Uh, it's not less than or it doesn't feel as sexy. It doesn't feel as attractive. It doesn't have all the sparkly lights and all the. Um, but that's but that's where the change really, really kind of settles in and gets embedded in the cells. Yeah. In my mind, so um when you were explaining the um yeah the nutritionist and people somebody going in and wanting to change i'm just thinking about like this medical perspective it's like oh there's something wrong with me i either need to get it out of my system whether that's through like medical surgery or from a drug to help cure me right away and it makes me wonder just around culture like the the thing that really popped in my head was like oh changing diet like how am i going to change my diet when i'm so busy running around doing a million things and you know maybe it costs a little bit more money to to uh, think about like organic foods Mm -hmm. and this and that Mm -hmm. um and i just wonder how the society that we lives in we live in that really kind of plays a role in how we perceive some of that work it's like an extra hassle of like oh man like i just want like this quickness because my life is already so full with like trying to juggle this and that and um i i i you i think you nailed it on the head i think it's exactly that 
I think it's part of our culture, right? It's part of us. When we moved into in industrial society, we moved into time becoming a very precious asset, which it is. But then we kind of generalize it to everything. Then, okay, t- I don't have time. I need the fastest track for healing. Yeah. I need the, f- we need, we are searching for the fastest tracks for everything. Although I think most of us know that any change takes time. And how do we, and you know, I, th- I thought about this because I think in the psychedelics community and specifically, and maybe in the uh, alternative health community, we all criticize the medical model, that the medical model is really bu- built on that idea. What is the fastest way we can get you out of here? What are the like most direct pointed interventions we can do? The pills, the surgeries, the thing. But there is no or very little uh, support of like, okay, now that you've had this surgery, what are the things you can do to make sure we're not gonna, you're not, you don't come back here for the same mm-hmm. problem? Yeah. And it's, I think there is something that we need to be that, and yet we're slowly doing the same thing in the psychedelic world. We're like, oh yeah, you, you know, two ses- preparation sessions, come and have an experience, two integration sessions, goodbye. Yeah. What? That's not enough. That's not enough for a move from, oh, here you came, we did an open heart surgery. We'll do two hours of like rehabilitation with you and then we'll send you to the world. Yeah. If anyone that's listening have ever had like a serious injury, you know that rehab can take months. Well, it's it's interesting. Yeah, you're bringing up that rehab piece because um, something else that just kind of popped in my head was thinking about this metaphor like to one degree, like Western medicine's great. Like I wouldn't be here mm-hmm. if it wasn't for Western medicine. I was really surprised actually how quick I was out of the hospital after my surgery um, at, when, when I got in that snowboarding accident. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but on the one hand, they didn't tell me to do any rehabilitation. And I asked my parents this. I was like, did they wow. tell me to go to a physical therapist or anything like that? And I don't think they gave us the instructions. And so... Um, you know, using this analogy, like, you know, I've, I've have like this huge scar on my abdomen and there is like some chronic pain. And every time I've gone to the doctors, there's just like, you know, it could be scar tissue ad- adhesions. And so when we're using this metaphor of the psychedelics, it's like, yeah, what if we op- do this open heart surgery? We, we do this surgery for people psychically and now the scar tissue starting to form and then we're not telling them to go get um, re- rehab. Thanks. And now all of a sudden it's causing all, all this difficulty later on in life when I started to see a physical therapist they're like wait you didn't like do any massage you didn't do any sort of body work after this like you just let this scar tissue hang for 10 years i'm like nobody wow. told me i you know i was like 16 i didn't know anything about how to treat my body at that point wow. um, i'm i'm shocked that you, they didn't tell you i mean you've been through a serious accident that there was no it's it's exactly that it's you know it may it makes me what you're saying makes me think about what's the right, the difference between curing and healing and symptom reduction and and deep healing, right? We can go to, well, I think there is, a, there is still a confusion in the psychedelic experiencing world where if I go and have an experience and my symptom is reduced, then we automatically associate that with something is resolved. And and even in psychology, it's known that the, even if you take medications, the best outcome for you is if you take medications and you do psychotherapy together. Mm-hmm. When they did that study and they did only medications versus only psychotherapy and the mixed group, the mixed group always got better results across the board. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it, it's, you're pointing out to like, yeah, okay, we, we heal the symptoms, we fixed you. But now what with the residual experience? What with what happened? Maybe you need to learn how to walk in a... I had like a very serious hip injury. I had to relearn how to walk. And it took me months. I had someone who guided me for months and literally walked with me mm. and taught me how to reuse my hip in a different way, how to move my, my knee in a different way to support what my hip needs. And for me, that was the integration. I was like, okay, that's... I went through this... Ex- the surgery was the experience and now this is the integration. It's learning. Yeah. And right in the... I, I love this metaphor because it's... I had to learn how to move my muscles differently. Right. How to like strengthen my leg in a different way, to stretch in a different way. So it's not just, okay, great. Had the surgery, we're done. 
right? So you go to a psychedelic experience, you realize that you want to be, the, the cause of your misery is uh, your negative self-talk. Okay, you decided you were going to, and you saw, you experienced yourself without the negative self-talk. Great, fantastic. Now, how are you going to start practicing not talking negatively to yourself once the experience is over? And what's going to happen when you start becoming happier? Like, okay, now that's going to create change. So there is a process. There is a process to be had. And we, we need to build those bridges. I, don't, I think, and to your second part, I think we don't talk about it because it's not, we can't sell that level of integration yet. Right. Right? We're still focused on, let's make it, for good reasons, let's make it legal, let's show the efficacy, let's show how it's working. Um, and it's it's still seductive to hear, you know, I, I always use this catchphrase because I don't like it. Um, but it sells the psychedelic science, which is 10 years of therapy in one session. Right. Five years of therapy. In a, and I always say, if you get 10 years of therapy in one psychedelic session, you had really bad therapy. Like that's just, it's just across the board. That's not because it's like that. It's because you had really shitty therapy. Uh, Thank you for highlighting that. I haven't really yes. challenged that statement like that. Before. I don't. And again, I think it comes from that place of, yes, psychedelics do offer us a deep dive into the psyche that talk therapy or any one, one dimension therapy can't. Um, but it's not going to cure your trauma in one sit or in one dieta or in one month retreat. You're not going to cure anything that you've been suffering from for 30, 40, 50 years. The, the psyche is not that elastic. It's not, it's, and it's not just the psyche. It's like, it's, it takes a while to change these deeply ingrained neural pathways, right? Behavior stuff like that we've been, that we have organized our personality and how we navigate the world around for so long. So it's also something about being compassionate with yourself. It's like, wait, it's, it's going to take me a moment. And can I love myself enough? Can I invest in myself? Or, you know, we, we had a talk with Jota Ford that you interviewed, and he talks in the Native American tradition, talk about it, the gift and responsibility for the gift. Mm. It's like, are you going to take responsibility by dedicating your time to your experience, to yourself over a prolonged period of time? And I don't think that integration sells. It's people are like, wait, what? I'm going to be sit with someone for another year after this experience right. to go. I don't know about that. Then what's the div? What's the point? Right? What's so attractive about that anymore? Um, Makes me think of two things. Um, this is something I heard from somebody years ago. And they're like, you know, it took me 50 years to dig this hole. And it's probably going to take me, you know, a long time to, to get myself out of it. Um, but also just thinking about like therapy, right? Like I've always kind of, um, before I kind of transitioned into more longer term therapy, always like short term therapy, like solution focused, like CBT oriented mm -hmm. therapy. And it's like, I guess from like the insurance perspective, the medical perspective, exactly. it's like, how do we get these short term therapies on board to make it more cost effective? Blah, blah, blah. And I think in general, it's harder to sell um, some of these longer term types of, of services, right? It, yeah. it, it, it's a commitment. Um, and how do, how do you sell that? Yes, like you might be doing this for, for a year and, and see slow progress, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's not sexy to a lot of people. They yeah. want to see that progress with over a few weeks, months, um, et cetera. So. Exactly. And you know, you're outlining something maybe bigger, which is there is something systemic, mm -hmm. because it's also not affordable for everybody. Right? Yeah. You know, I know a lot of people who really are one can really benefit from psychedelic therapy, but they can't afford to spend a whole year with someone right now. They have no. like survival needs that are much more important. Yeah. And how do we even think about that, like making it accessible to marginalized communities, to people who can't afford to sit in a fancy office with a psychedelic therapist once a week for, for a year or two years? Yeah. Because it's right now it's we don't I don't I mean I know there are communities but we're slowly creating this like severe in inclusion criteria, mm. which is if you're not middle upper class you're not going to benefit from this yeah. unless somehow you manage to find your way into a study, right? Right. So again, it's and and 
which again goes back into what you said, which is a bigger complex around insurance and the politics of insurance and money and the politics of healthcare and insurance and money and yeah. all these bigger things. Do you think somebody needs to work individually all the time for like <laughs> good integration or like, I'm just thinking again, accessibility, people that can't access this, like could groups be beneficial or like what could people be doing to get the most out of it if they don't have access? To I'm, I'm, therapy? you know, I'm an integration nerd. So I'm like, integration <laughs> is across the board. So I'm like individual and group. Yes. Do both. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, definitely, definitely. I think groups can be, I think groups sometimes can be more helpful for certain individuals. Um, I think for some individuals, the idea of sitting one-on-one -on -one can be very threatening or overwhelming or intense. Um, and maybe starting with a group when the focus is not necessarily just on you, uh, you get to hear other people's experience, which, you know, from the groups we have done, people say how that really helps them actually normalize their shame their stuff like mm. it really helps with this like oh i'm not uniquely injured or wounded or traumatized because this per person is suffering and this purple this person also has like suicidal ideation or they had also this really out there experience and they saw machine elves like it's not crazy i didn't imagine that or whatever that is so it creates this like it helps with decreasing of shame or judgment around one's experience or oneself and which actually makes the person want to start um, both sharing and interacting with their experience on a deeper level. Because I think shame and judgment can be two things that can really make you not want to touch your experience. Mm. Um, and I think individual is definitely very helpful. Um, there is limitations, there is pluses and minuses to both group and individual. I think an individual, you can definitely go deeper. Um, you get, yeah. I always say that it's, for most of us, it's really rare to get undivided attention from someone around our most vulnerable topics of conversation inside um, without being judged or with minimal judgment, with minimal criticism. Um, and really, yeah, having a space where you are not worried about or less worried about how you're being perceived, which allows for a deeper level of honesty and vulnerability to come out, mm -hmm. which usually there, there is a lot of juice to process. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like a member, um, good friend and brilliant colleague, Tanya Kumanan, who is now in Peru, she talked about that there is Usually, when she worked in the Temple of the Way of Light, she said there's two levels of <clears throat> preparation. Usually, people have an intention there. They feel comfortable enough sharing. And then there is one that they don't feel comfortable. Right. Yeah. And if you're able to build a relationship of trust with one person or in a small group, that deeper intention will come up. And then you, have, you can really work with that very raw, vulnerable thing and take it that into your experience. So I think both every setting has its 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 beauty. I think that in my you know in my ideal people will do both. There will be accessibility to do both, so you can benefit from both worlds. And it's the closest thing to I think copying the like the village model, mm. right? Where you would come out of an experience and your neighbor did it, and your your all your friends have done it, or their parents have done it. So you have this community that you can go and share your experience with, but you can also talk about it with maybe the shaman of the village or your father has done it and they might have wisdom, this one-on-one -on -one experience that you can have. So in, in interpreting or like translating that to our Western culture, I think that's the closest interpretation we can have. Yeah. So I say not, not either or both, definitely both. Yeah. Yeah. As you were speaking, I was just reflecting on some of my earlier experiences and, and just how important like breath work was to me because it did offer that mm. kind of village type of model of like being in community, having experience, uh, able to go deep with a group of people that are kind of on the same thing. And I mean, it was really unique, I think, there because it would be the same people. 
And so you're able to really yeah. start forming those those deeper relationships versus going to retreats where it may be different people all the mm-hmm. time. I mean, you know, there would be different people showing up, but there was always some core group of people that would be there all the time. Um, and knowing the limitation there of, okay, like I do want to go deeper. Like I do need some individual attention to go deeper into this. Um, so yeah, I, I'd love to see kind of like a, that holistic model, but yeah, the accessibility piece I think is, is one of the bigger uh, conversations like, mm-hmm. yeah, how do we make, um, you know, individual treatment more accessible to, to mm-hmm. some people that, that really need it? Yeah, we, there's, there's a lot of gaps in that conversation. And I like, I want to borrow what you brought about. I think it's, there is also which kind of group, mm. uh, you know, as some, as someone who's be, who belonged to a group that was ongoing for seven years, like a group of people who were in this work and facilitating these groups, the more it's the same people, the group starts to, there is this beautiful thing that happens. People feel a lot more comfortable always obviously sharing. But people also feel more comfortable starting to hold each other accountable. Right. Which really, and not in a judgmental, hey, you're fucking up kind of way, but in a, hey, I'm seeing that, you know, you've been reporting the same, you're working on the same thing or struggling with the same thing for the last three, four experiences. Like, what's going on for you? Or, you know, we... Integrity, like, hey, you know, you, you're doing these things that feel out of integrity to what you're sharing with the group. Like, what's going on? And I think that's a really, we need someone to to mirror to us the, right, our blind spots, our shadow yeah. points. And not in a way to make us feel guilty, but in a way to help us kind of keep growing and integrating. Yeah. Right? So if I come back from an experience and I'm telling you, hey, Kyle, you know, I'm, I heard this very clear message from the plants. They told me to stop drinking kombucha because of the caffeine and I'm going to get rid of like all the junk food. And you see me two weeks later, like eating, a, you know, this whoever eats it, good for you, eating McDonald's and drinking like a whole thing. And you're like, so you can come to me and be like, hey, you know, like what's going on? Yeah. You know, you were very inspired about not doing that. And for us to have that trust that I can be like, okay, all right, thank you. You're, you're helping me reconnect with the knowledge, with the wisdom of what I experienced. And now I can reflect and be like, okay, what's going on for me? So I'm not alone. We're not alone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, going back to, I guess, uh, some of like the longer term therapy and, and treatment. Um, I know that you, you, you come kind of from that, that, that depth oriented tradition and, you know, it does take a while to really kind of go into the psyche. And I wonder, you know, just from some of your work, like how long does it take for people to like really go deep? Right. And I'm just thinking wow. about this from, you know, people that I've worked with where, yeah, it takes a very long time. And I'm, I, I, what I wrote down was trust and safety. Right. And it's like some of that healing takes a very long time. Um, and it doesn't happen overnight and we do need to, you know, take time to really build that rapport, that trust, that safety for people that will allow that to, to then go a lot deeper. I totally agree with you. Trust and safety. And there is for me also the element of commitment, like how committed are you to your process mm-hmm. and what comes out of your process? Um, and I want to, someone sent to me, um, this passage where someone asked, asked Carl Jung why he never tried psychedelics. Mm. And I wanna, I'm want i not going to butcher it, so I'm going to just read it to you. Um, his answer was, diving into the unconscious always gives you more task and, tasks and responsibilities. And add to that our dreams and intuition who give us even more assignments to do. It's probably unlikely that I finished doing all my assignments and my responsibilities from what I already have as unconscious knowledge. So taking psychedelics on top of it feels like I would doing the service to myself. Mm-hmm. And there is something so dry, but also so in integrity about, yeah, like, you know, I think that's part of what hard for all of us is the psyche has an organic life. It opens up in the way it opens up. 
you can bathe yourself in ayahuasca and eat 50 grams of mushrooms per week. You're not, you can't, there are certain processes you can't rush. Mm -hmm. And his answer of like, be honest with yourself about where you are in your process, how much more responsibility you need to take. So it depends on what you're going in for. It depends on how deep you, you know, people ask me that about how long does therapy take? I'm like, it depends why you come to therapy. If you're coming to therapy to work on a specific problem, it might be take shorter. If you come to therapy as a way to like explore your inner world and how and you want to become a more integrated person, it can take many years. It really depends. But I think it's trust, it's safety, it's the commitment you make to your process. Um, it's how creative and playful you want to be with that process too. I think yeah. therapy, psychedelic or not, you, it doesn't it doesn't have to be this. We still carry this stereotype that it's this serious, heavy thing, and I think it can become a very beautiful, creative, yeah. playful space where we get to play with the world in a different way, like try new things out and see what happens. Or try new hobbies out and see what happens. Try and, yeah. you know, walking left instead of right and seeing how does that feel? Does that feel good? Maybe I learned something new. Maybe I have a new encounter. Um, so, but I think, again, if for deep embodied, and that's the word that keeps coming back, integration, yeah. it can take time. I've, I shared a story. I've worked with someone who I really appreciated her. And we had eight meetings just for preparation which is by far the longest preparation process so i'm talking about someone who came specifically for and when she came back from her ayahuasca retreat she said you know i cannot tell you how helpful that was because nothing that came up for me surprised me mm -hmm. and i was able to sit with whatever came up in a much more grounded, connected way, because we already talked about it. And I f connected to it and I felt it. So nothing was came on as like this shocking, oh my God, I've never thought about this. This is terrifying kind of experience. Yeah. Um, I recommend to people, if you specifically are psychedelics, if you come back, give yourself, if you don't want to commit to a full therapeutic process, give yourself at least anywhere between four and six integration meetings mm -hmm. and do it over time. time and yeah. in between do also the things you need that you are either you experienced or it comes through the integration process that you see are, can be helpful for you. So there, that's the commitment part. Yeah. Give yourself time, commit to your process, commit to doing small things and accumulate and have patience. Yeah. Patience is key. Have and patience. I'm, I always, I think this kind of comes from Arnold Mendel from process, but um, process oriented psychology. But yeah, how do we continue to stay curious around our process and don't get ahead of the medicine? Um, and for me, I think that's a that's a big lesson where it's like, oh, I got it all figured out and I know what to do and I'm healed. And da -da. It's like, no, how do we stay engaged? How do we stay curious around mm -hmm. the unfolding? Um, there were a few things that came up um, as you were speaking. Um, the Carl Jung quote remind me something um, a past guest said. Um, I can't believe I'm spacing on his name. Um, uh, Jeremy Narby. <laughs> Sorry, Jeremy. It's <laughs> a big name. <laughs> took, took, yeah, it, took, well, it just took me a while to go back into the archive of my brain. Um, and he said, I, I think we made like a little quote thing or something around it, but he said, you know, I, I just don't understand how we can constantly engage in a, an activity that gives us years and years of work to do. And so I'm thinking about that, that Carl Jung quote, it's like, oh yes, I'm thinking about the assignments and the things that have been like, I'm still not executing on all that, right? And it feels like I still have a lot of work to do and, and focus my attention on there. And, you know, it's interesting how that changes over time, uh, you mm -hmm. know, like years later going back and revisiting, which I think is important to kind of revisit the sure. process. But yeah, it seems to be these common themes that come up. It's like, oh, yeah, this is an assignment that I just keep getting reminded of. And it feels like it's going to take a lifetime to, to figure out. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and so the other point just around safety and trust and, and how long this healing process is, um, I was reminded after an experience I had back in um, beginning of 2020, 
I think I've talked about this on the show before, but, um, you know, I've worked with this near death experience for so much working with, and when I, when I share it, I usually talk about the blissful, beautiful aspects of it. Um, and I had this experience where I was back in the cat skin machine dying and I started to get into a really scary point around that experience. And when, and I noticed every time I get there, my body goes into fight or flight and I want to get away i want to shut it down um and at that moment since you know being able to like be more somatically engaged in my process and and to stick with it in a different way i said oh my god i was afraid so i'm like reliving myself being a 16 year old being afraid Mm -hmm. and it took me 16 17 years to feel that every time i would share that story i would really focus on the bliss part um and you know that was a, a reminder of going you know even though i've been working on this in all sorts of capacities for for this many years it took me that long to touch into that emotion because my body couldn't handle it every time i would touch it, it it was just too much and i would go into either shut down or shut down mode or needing mm-hmm. to get out of a situation mm-hmm. um and so i always you know that that was a big reminder it takes time and it's okay that it takes time um you know, we talked about it in one of the groups we did that uh, it seems like a lot of that when you when people come seeking psychedelic therapy to really wonder how much is um, despair and suffering part of the motivation. Because they 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 are suffering so much they don't want to wait. They don't want to they don't have time. Yeah. And how humanly, how human it is, and how natural that is, because it's really hard to reconcile. If your if your trauma is so is impending on your life so much that it's impacting you on a day to day basis, obviously you want to get rid of it. Yeah. Right. No, no matter. You know, there's so many people who go down to Peru and they're like, "This is my last. This is the last resort. I've tried everything." Like if this doesn't work, right? It's sad to say, but there's, I've heard this sentence a lot. If this doesn't work for me, I don't know what I'm going to do. Yeah. And there is something there about, and that's why I think we need to think about long-term care is to get, move away from this idea that psychedelics are a panacea and it still gets talked about it in that way. And it still gets portrayed in that way. So maybe it's not one session, it's two session and two integration sessions. And then you're a totally different person, right? Like the next, the, the wave I see now is how all these memes and stuff about how ketamine cures depression. That's it. 60 year depression, no problem. Six sessions, you're good. And it's, it hurts me because it's, it's offering an unrealistic ideal for people who are suffering yeah. and are struggling with the factor of time because people want to have a good life. Yeah. And when you're suffering over a prolonged amount of time, you're like, oh, my God, my time is running out. Mm-hmm. And I think there is something in a container that can help you remember, like, yes, you're suffering. But also, can you remember, let's let's think about how you can play as you're suffering. Let's help you integrate this. Um, I work with someone who was pretty suicidal and started ketamine treatments in conjunction with our therapy. And they had a very, uh, um, very abusive inner critic. And in the ketamine experience, it's the first time in their life that they had a break. And you just, you saw a different person. All of a sudden there was a zest for life and a desire to go out and try new hobbies and do new things. And luckily we had a good enough, there was enough trust, like you said, that we both could acknowledge like that critic is not going anywhere, but we can help take that experience of freedom and zest and aliveness again and practice it and build time and build practice. So all of a sudden there was, yes, there was an acknowledgement that this is going to take time, but it also opened the space of like, oh, I can suffer and have joy in my life at the same time. Mm. I can suffer and go play. I can suffer and have a hobby. While before that, it was just suffering. Like paralyzing suffering. Mm. And yeah, it's... I mean, this is why I think, you know, I'm excited for Vital and the idea of depth being there because time is one of the most important 
challenging, beautiful, and sometimes paralyzing archetypes that we encounter with. Yeah. Right. And we all get to that point where we get old and then all of a sudden we start really feeling the gravity of time when your body doesn't heal as fast and you can't do what you used to do and you start thinking about the end, right? So that's like the other place where psychedelics is so beautiful, which is end of life. Yeah. I don't know if there is studies, but I would love for more studies about not just for people who are end of life about to die, but people who are like, I want to live, I want to have a happier elderly life. Mm. How do I deal with acceptance of time and my bodily limitations and the fact that I'm not, but still enjoy this time that I have in between 60 and 90, have a full life, 70, 90, whatever that is, 60 and 100. Um, It'd be beautiful if we could um, have that available. And again, I think that's like one of the restrictions of the medical model of like needing some sort of diagnosis. I remember when we had Dr. Catherine McLean on, um, uh, McLean, McLean, um, and, uh, you know, she, she kind of threw this out there around, nobody knows when they're going to die. And, you know, should we have access to this to help us just prepare at any point um, around death and dying? And I, you know, obviously I'm a little bit biased because it's like <laughs> I know that that's a very, very real thing. It's like, yes, I think we should. Um, I, I think we should. And can we have access for it to learn how to live better? Yeah. <laughs> you know, before well, it goes we back to that, that that saying, I, uh, you know, how you live your life is how you prepare for death and how you prepare for death is how you live your life. Live your life. Yep. Um, and... and that's why I think, you know, having access to stuff like transpersonal, like depth therapy, like growth, like Jung, it can be so helpful for us when we deal with this, because I think for them, it was really about. How do you bring your body, your emotions, your psyche, your spirit into consciousness so you can have a fulfilling life? Not necessarily happy, just to be stuck in happiness or joy, but a truly fulfilling embodied life, right? You can call it individuation. How do you keep integrating and unfolding that thing that is you? Yeah. And not wait until you're 90 or 90 until you're 80 or not get there at all, maybe, but like make that as. Yeah, make that a priority in your life. Yeah. And that that's such a, and to infiltrate, right, the, the state of consciousness that we are kind of get lulled into in the, the westernized world, which is, it's not about that. It's mm-hmm. not about your fulfillment. Or fulfillment is measured in material success or how many kids you have or right any kind of form of status. It's about no, you can be it's about you authentically feeling fulfilled. Yeah. Whatever that looks like. And giving us permission or get us giving ourselves permission to start living that way. I think that's a that's it, right? Like giving ourselves permission because it's exactly. hard to give ourselves permission to very feel that. Um I'm curious, you know, you, you just brought up again like the transpersonal the, the depth. Why is this important for people to understand and, you know, also the challenges with this type of work, right? Mm-hmm. Um I think in the traditional world it's like what is this transpersonal depth oriented work and you know how do you like you know measure it and this and that because you know sometimes yeah that is involved more in kind of like this longer term treatment where you get you're maybe confronting with a lot of images and um you're working with psyche in a different way Mm -hmm. and yeah so why is it important and also yeah the challenges of trying to integrate a lot of this you know we we get pushback every once in a while from um some of our you know transpersonal stuff but but, um, and it's interesting. I think it's. Did you say what's the pushback? I'm curious, and uh, then a different. Um, way. just like you know, just comments throughout the years, just around um, you know, needing it to be very rigorous. Like, why talk about archetypes? Why talk about this? Like, um, you know, the spirit aspect when you start talking about shamanism. Like, you know, shouldn't be talking about this, and it needs to be very Western and and medical, and that's the, you know, and I think there's like the. 
that side that's just really concerned around it getting legalized. But, you know, I'm also, you know, I think about the people that are having these experiences, for example. Um, and how do we contain that and provide support to, to those folks? Um, because if we just brush it under the rug, what type of harm does that then um, maybe perpetuate with somebody that is having these experiences, doesn't have the support, doesn't know where to look? Um, right. Mm. Um, wow, that's for me. I think these models are working for a few reasons. One, they're integrated models, so it's body, your body, your physical body, your emotional body, your psyche, and your spirit. So none, nothing gets left outside in that way. Um, and. I thought, I thought about it last night when I was thinking about our conversations was if I'm going to be dropped, if I dropped anyone off in Antarctica without any map, <laughs> most of us will probably get, I would probably get lost <clears throat> and I have I army training would. and stuff like that. And I would probably get lost and die at some point. <clears throat> it's the same thing. If you go to psych do psychedelic work, you're going to open up your psyche, your personal and your collective psyche. And you're going to go into like terrains that you have no idea where you're going. Yeah. That can be dangerous. <clears throat> so the idea is to have models that give us, they're like GPS for the psyche. They don't tell you, they don't, they're not there to give you answers, but opposed to kind of help you understand the landscape and, oh, why is that tree sitting on top of that thing? And why is that flower growing specifically from that bush i don't know right or whatever that is and in that way you can build a um and for me that's the the main point you can build a relationship with it because the moment things are overwhelming scary shameful we will it would be very hard for us to relate to them and that that we cannot relate to stays and not just stays it's in the background as like some kind of operating system yeah and it's basically making decisions for us <clears throat> So it's to have this like maps that, you know, wiser people have built for us that we can take and use. And if they fit, great. Maybe they don't fit. Yeah. For some people they do, for some people they don't. Um, I, I like that. I mean, that's how I, I really approach it. Um, it's like having a framework can be helpful, right? It doesn't define the territory all the time. Exactly. But, um being lost at sea is pretty scary. Um, or just being lost in general without any sort of context, direction. It's like, mm -hmm. I don't, I mean, it's, I've been there before and it's disorienting. Um, and, and I mean that in like a psychological way when I was going through like spiritual emergence and I'm like, I, uh, I need something to grab onto because it, everything just is not making sense right now. Um, exactly. And we don't have a village. Yeah. Right. We don't have a village that, is gonna is gonna say you know what okay kyle you went down the deep end you don't want to look at the map great but come here we'll feed you we'll make sure you're bathing until your psyche will do what it needs to do to kind of come back into shape we don't have that yeah most of people go they do whatever they do and they have to show up to work on monday that's a lot of psychic pressure it's it's yeah. we don't understand how challenging it is for the psyche to move from I was in the jungle on Saturday, like communing with the, the earth and talking with, with animals and plant spirits to doing an Excel sheet on Monday. <laughs> uh. The fact that the psyche is so helpful and, and flexible in that way that it can organize itself so fast doesn't mean it doesn't create pressure right. and stress inside. Eventually, that's going to take a toll in some way. So I think we need, we need those maps. And it's, you know, something that I like to, for me, integration is not to find exclamation marks. It's to keep deepening. Yeah. It's to open more and more and more and more. That's why I think if you know how to work in a mindful way with integration, you don't need a lot of experiences. You can work a long time with one experience and keep opening up more doors and more assignments will come in and more responsibilities, right? Uh, Does it have an end? Death. death yeah. 
death is the end of individuation mm. and the beginning of another phase of, right? yeah. well we're not gonna go there but another phase of individuation um what's your take on i guess like um you know goals like i need to come back and really finish x y and z and where it becomes more like systematic to some degree um because i'm hearing like this unfoldment process and staying open but for those that do come back with pretty specific goals um and they really want to meet that like you know is there an end to some degree with some I of these do. smaller I things do. i do i do think you know i like to call those like psychedelic recipes i think sometimes we mm. can come back with you know, I remember having an experience where I had this very clear insight that there is this one restaurant that I eat a lot in and that the f that I should not eat there anymore. That there was something in the food that was not good for my body. Mm. And I haven't eaten there since. I was oh. like, okay, that's very clear. <laughs> um, I think it's great to have goals. I think it's it's good to have Uh, like milestones, like stepping milestones. Mm. What I do, what I am going to advocate for is that make sure that your goals are not bypassing. Meaning mm. if I have a lifelong history of trauma with my father and I all of a sudden I'm like, you know what's the best way to deal with this trauma? Just disappear, make my father disappear from my life. Mm. That can be a goal. And I can write him a scolding letter letting all my anger go and all the accusations and all that and send a letter and cut him off from my life. And if I think that I've worked that out with that one goal, that's where I would get a little worried about how mm. goals are being used. So like, if anything, make sure, how do you use your goals? Mm. Are my goals bypassing maybe something, like you said, that needs to be a longer process. Right. Um, but I do, I'm very much in the in the sense that um depends on what but integration at some point has to be needs to become implementation mm, yeah right even if it's a change in a thinking pattern or a behavioral pattern or a feeling pattern or taking on a new spiritual practice it's like wow you guys i went to the plants and they said yoga go do yoga great two weeks yet later i still haven't done yoga but i know that it's really good for me it's like no that's a goal yeah. go do it Try it out. So, because I think sometimes it's depends on the person. Some some personality structures can get stuck in inner a lot of inner dwelling. Mm, yeah, it's very seductive, and then it doesn't get in, interpreted. And s maybe that's more introverted types, but it maybe more extroverted types will be much more action oriented, as opposed to like let me sit with this for a little longer. I'm the sitting with. I could sit there and analyze forever. Same. <laughs> um, and there, so there is a balance there. And, yeah. you know, this uh, It also made me, th you're making me think about something that um, I've been thinking. There is this article that's been floating around about um, is every insight from a psychedelic experience true? And a great question. Uh, that, a great question. And, you know, it made me think about that philosophical discussion of if something is true today, it should be true three weeks from now. Mm. Right. So I'm thinking about more of those experiences where someone you can come out and like, OK, you know, I have to end that relationship, quit that job, move to the forest. I'm like, if it's true today, it will be true three weeks from now. Sit with it. If in three weeks after you said, digested, let it kind of sift through your system, that goal still feels real for you, by all means. But a lot of the time that can just be like a very, it can be something else. Yeah. I remember uh, on this topic uh, years ago when Joe and I were kind of preparing and prepping for this uh, philosophy of psychedelics class that we were running with um, our teacher Lenny. Um, we were just going through a lot of Plato's work and um, <clears throat> Euthyphro, um, that that section in Plato's work. And uh, it was really interesting because there's this whole d dilemma around um, piety, but also around, you know, the gods are saying X, Y, and Z, we need to do this, right? And it brings up a really interesting philosophical question of, should you actually listen to that? 
Do you need to listen to that? Just because the it's gods or, or Mother Ayahuasca said this, does that mean make it true? And do you need to follow through with that? So mm -hmm. I think the whole, I forget the, the context, sorry for the philosophy uh, buffs that are on this, but I think it was around somebody dying or, or the gods told somebody to kill somebody or, or something like that. And it's like, um, you know, yeah, should you listen to that? Just because the gods or Mother Ayahuasca told you X, Y, and Z, do you follow mm -hmm. through? And I mm -hmm. think this is the conversation around discernment. We really yes. need to like understand how do we discern information? Um, how do we make sense of it? And what feels like our truth? Um, mm -hmm. and this uh, total, I, discernment is, is the word. And also that we want to make sure we're not bypassing, that we're not giving our power away to the plants. Mm to the yeah. plants you can't see me but i'm air quoting air. like it's it's i think I'll, there's a lot when we feel powerless or helpless or really struggle with something our psyche will create a situation where we hear a voice saying something but it can be actually a, a way to bypass st sitting in the stoop yeah of like i am struggling with this relationship i am struggling with this thing I go to a psychedelic and I hear a voice saying, you should leave this person. Great. Dilemma solved. But am I really whole with that decision? Mm. Am I, does it make me feel empowered in the end of the day? Or am I going to stay with this narrative of like the plants told me that's it. You know, I've heard actually someone, um, Peruvian female shaman who said that, she we were talking about this and she said you know it's actually pretty rare to hear the plants that clearly mm. and you need a lot of practice most people think they hear the plants but it's not the plants right which was a revelation to me i was like oh who did she say it was was it just like your internal voice she said or... it's your internal it's it's some part of you yeah that it's some aspect of the person mm. that is finally having space to like be heard mm. And all of a sudden, it's well, because if the plan said it, who are, you're not going to argue with the gods, right? Who are, I'm not going to argue with a plant entity, but if it's part of me, ah, I don't know, you know, I'm not sure. Sure, can I trust that part of me, right? It requires yeah. you to go deeper into yourself, yeah. Um, so for us to just be worried, like to be, to be discerning and to have some to allow some critical thinking. Critical thinking is not a bad thing. It's not. It's. I think it's very important, especially in in this in this field in this world, right? I, I always come back to uh, Terence McKenna. Psychedelics um, seem to foster funny ideas, um, and I think I don't know if it was in the Brotherhood of the Sp Screaming Abyss or somewhere, um, but it sounded like yeah, there was a point where like somebody became very questionable of whether what was coming through from the mushrooms like you know these are kind of trickster ener energy why why should i listen to that all the time mm -hmm. um and yeah so discernment is is, is a big piece um we're coming I like this at... piece for i'm sorry I, I don't want, no, but no in your last podcast with um emma farrell she was talking about uh this rule of three which is if you meet an entity you need to ask them three times for their name and if they're malicious if they're here to help you or not yeah and I love that because it has like the sermon and critical thinking embedded into it. It's like, I don't trust you the first, I'm not going to trust the first thing I hear, nor the second thing. Like if you hit me three times, then maybe I'll trust you. And then there is some, it's, I read about that actually in Ayahuasca in my blood, which is one of the best Ayahuasca books there. And he said the same, his teacher in the book says, if you meet an entity, first ask them a few times, like, who are they? And are they here to help you or not? So yes, for us to like be, just be mindful when we're like relinquishing our, our critical thinking and our discernment as some way to receive help or guidance versus yeah. receiving help and guidance and being able to sit with it. Yeah. And I think too, um, one skill that, that has been really crucial for me um, is really listening to my body. Um, mm. I, it, you know, I'm sure I shared lots of different stories here on the podcast or those that have been in navigating psychedelics have probably heard some of my intuitions um, that, 
felt crazy at times and manifesting to be true. Um, and you know, it's, it was really like listening to my body going, no, something feels off here. Um, even though like this seems like a weird thought, something feels a little off. Um, and I try to listen to that, but when it it seems like a sensation for you, like, a. uh, tightness somewhere or something like a sickness like i can't Uh shake it um Uh yeah yeah i'll give it like one time uh, when i was in college um i just had this like really this bad anxiety attack that um somebody was going to rob our house um and my friends were like kyle you need to chill out like you're fine and i'm like no you don't understand like something is gonna happen so we 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 took a walk around the block just to try to chill out um and woke up in the morning um saw like my roommate's stuff out in the driveway um and i was like hmm i guess uh they they partied a little hard last night um but i come back and everybody's like on edge and they knew something happened um they're like what the hell happened last night like something feels off and then finally one of our other friends came in they're like you wouldn't believe what happened i was like it was four o'clock in the morning um i woke up and i saw this guy just standing in the doorway with you know your bag and this and that um we made eye contact he darted out the the house and i guess dropped everything in the driveway um but it's like one of those things of like there's why am i having this weird paranoid thought Mm -hmm. um it feels kind of silly and my friends were like what are you what's going on here but there was something so somatic about it where i I couldn't shake it like it just i I was trying to discern i'm like is this you know some sort of past trauma response where something triggered me is this you know i'm trying to do all this like parts work like what part of me is not feeling safe right you know i'm like really digging in but there was just something in there i just couldn't really shake it just like was so in my body that i'm like i can't explain it um and sometimes i listen to that stuff even though i don't always take action on everything but there's something there where i'm like "Uh, this deserves a little bit of attention that's that, thank you. That's yeah. Right. I mean, it seems like trust is a big thing in this conversation. Like also trusting yourself as part of your. Yeah. I actually love that as an integration practice. Mm. Like for if you're not that connected to your body, look for those sensations in response to events and start getting curious about those sensations. Right? Yeah. Why is my left knee scratch like itching as hell right now? Like what's going yeah. on? Um. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's a great example. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um. So we're at time, but um, there is another question that 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 we typically ask. How are you doing on time? Uh, we're great. We have okay, time. Okay. Cool. Um. So the the next question is, what's the most vital teaching point that psychedelic practitioners need to become skilled and expert in? And maybe we've touched on this a little bit, but maybe not. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it out there. Um. Trauma, trauma mm. work. Yeah. I think trauma is a very big buzzword right now. And mm-hmm. I've never encountered this idea of a trauma coach or trauma specialist, something until the last five, eight years when psychedelics became really, really big. Mm-hmm. Um, we need to, at the risk of being a party pooper, we need to be really honest with ourselves about our capacity. Like, what do we yep. know? I I don't believe you can learn deeply what it means and how to work with trauma if you took a one-year course or a two-year course. Mm-hmm. You can definitely sit with people and help them be when they visit traumas or like digest and process, but from my what I've learned, my experience, trauma work takes a long time, requires a lot of training. Mm-hmm. Holding trauma for someone or and or versus diving with them into the world of their inner trauma is very, very different. Mm-hmm. And that's something we need to really talk about because as if we're gonna start providing long term care for people. That's very different than having people just, you know, dive into their trauma in one big um peak experience so we really need to think about what does trauma work looks like in short-term psychedelic treatment what does it look like for long-term 
um, what kind of education therapist needs who are going to be doing this work or already doing this work. Um, Do you have any favorite resources or techniques or trainings? Oof, there's so much. Um, you know, now there is so much. There is the, you know, as you know, the somatic oriented trauma, like interventions like SE and Akomi and uh, stuff like that. There is the more depth oriented archetypal work, right? Which is like diving into Jung or Donald Kelshed's work is incredible. Um, highly recommend checking them there is right there is also cbt versions of working with trauma which will be a lot more about exposures or you know mindfulness and dbt and stuff like that um i think it's i think first and foremost it's about you know we talked about it in our group it's about being in integrity and having people around you who are also professionals to be able to tell you like maybe you're out of your scope mm. And to be honest with your experience, like if you're sitting with someone and they repetitively overwhelm you when they get into their trauma story, that's information. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so first to be in integrity with yourself and then go to go seek, seek whatever trauma trainings are available, what's interesting to you. Um, I'm just really concerned about, because I've worked with people who went to see um, for, you know, underground psychedelic work or went to Central South America and actually came back more traumatized. Yeah. They got in touch with their trauma, their trauma, really their complexes, their patterns really came alive. And the people who were holding their experience did it poorly mm -hmm. or actually reacted out their own stuff in response. Um, I shared this story with you. I remember going, I work with a guy who a lot of his trauma is shame based around being inadequate. And he did an underground session with someone. And this person was screaming at him that he's not focused enough and he needs a breakthrough and was basically shaming him for not having a peak experience. So unbeknownst to that person, she was trauma. She was sitting right on top of his trauma of inadequacy. It ended up being good for him because he was able to do something he can't, which was get really angry, right? tell this person to shut up and leave the room, <laughs> which is usually he can't do that with people when people shame him. But Right. Um, and I think it was Bia who also, that there is this thing of, there is, uh, I don't remember how she called it, but something about the psychedelic experiences can be traumatizing on their own. Totally. And I think it can be twice as traumatizing if you're, you're doing trauma work and the space can't beat can't you. In a, in a, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I just very, I'm just very mindful and want to be very protective of that because I've worked with people who came back and they were like, my trauma came up and I was told to shut up. I was told to like that I'm being overdramatic, that I'm not doing my work, that and just it created it just amplified the shame and feeling of there's something wrong with me. Mm. And that's painful. That is. Yeah. I think. So, yeah. So, Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, no, I was going to say, I think a lot of like the trauma work that I've done really reminds me or just around how important it is to go slow um, and to really titrate the experience. Um, and I've even noticed that in, in some of the, the ketamine work I, I've done um, just how, you know, you know, there's the part that is like, oh, we, we, we want the mystical transpersonal experience to unfold. And I could see how some practitioners are showing up. And since this is the narrative, we need to have the mystical experience. We need yes. to give you a higher dose. We need you to go in there to heal that trauma. But pulling back and saying, is that too overwhelming for the nervous system? And I think we need to be honest with ourselves. If you've had your own experiences to sit there and really reflect, and I've done a lot of reflecting on this and sometimes it was challenging. And I think it was Peter Levine who really set me off saying a lot of the quote unquote primal therapies that came out of Esalen um, actually re-triggered trauma for people. So holotropic breath work for example and you know the gestalt therapy and i'm sitting there going no breath work it's always been positive <laughs> and i had to sit there and really think was it 
And there are times when it really blew me out. And I think about some of my psychedelic experiences early on, catapulting me in spiritual emergence, traumatizing, took me forever to shake that stuff out of my body. Um, and so I think, yeah, we, we do need to be honest around the, the potential harms here um, as well as going too quick, too much. Cause I mean, that, that was my thing. It's like, if I'm not having a big experience, then I'm not doing it right. Um, and now I'm on the side of, can we go a little slower here? How can mm -hmm. we really tolerate the experience in the nervous system? Because if it's outside that window of tolerance, it's going to be way too much. That's such, I'm, I love that you brought that. I think that's such, I w we need to highlight what you just said even more. If we can't tolerate, if I can't tolerate it, I can't digest it. If I can't digest yeah. it, I can't integrate it. It means that that experience is going to be either stuck in my system or I'm going to have to shut down, right? Protect myself and not let that experience move at all. Yeah. And I think that's a big part of, the, the, the training that all of us who are in this world need to really think of is also like check our own agendas as part of being psychedelic therapists mm -hmm. or coaches or whatever, right? Yeah. If I am invested in my client getting somewhere, I need to pause. Because yeah. it doesn't matter how many times I've had experiences or what I think works. It's like what you said, it's what's right for them. Yeah. And maybe... And I had to pull back on like protocols, you know, cause I'm like eye shades, headphones, right. And I'm noticing just tuning and being like, I don't know if this is actually mm. feeling safe for this person right now. Wow. How do we have maybe a, a little bit of more of a psycholytic therapy dose first um, and slowly to kind of titrate that experience until they're ready for that experience. Yes. But again, that comes back into our original conversation, meaning more sessions, more time, more expenses, um, and then it doesn't turn into this sexy thing. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I never, I love that you brought that. I've never even thought that's given so much weight to even, is the person feeling good being blindfolded? I was surprised at a, a few. Yeah, they just not. It was just like I don't know if I want to do that right now. And I'm coming from this, you know, this protocol and this training of no, this is how we do it. And exactly. needing to kind of pull back and be like, well, yeah, let's examine this. Like, why? Yeah, let's not do that right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. what, what what makes you feel good right now? And yeah, maybe we don't need to do that. But then it gets in the point of like, are they bypassing? Should I show up as the expert and try to like, you know, shape this experience for them? Um, <laughs> and, you know, that, that doesn't feel good because I'm also trying to place myself in their shoes and be like, would I want somebody to do that to me? And yeah. I don't think so. I like the encouragement, but I don't want to be told to do something mm -hmm. a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the last that you're making me think of though, maybe a last point before we, as part of us training ourselves around trauma and our own things to be very cautious of going so fast into, oh, you know, this person is, it's their ego, it's their resisting, right? That seems like the new trash bin for like all resistances and things and say, like, oh, it's their ego. It's your ego is there for a reason. Yeah. Without your ego, your functioning will be a lot harder. Like, right? I'm not gonna even go into is ego death a real thing or not. We're not gonna go into that. But like again, just being mindful of our own biases as people who are being entrusted in guiding other people to these very deep terrains of un the unconscious, of the unknown, of the mystical, of the personal. Because um, a lot of our agendas come from our own wounds our own yeah. narcissism, our own need to know, to be right, to be big in some way. Yeah. So I love what you said, slow down, slow down. It's funny how when we slow down, things become clear faster. <laughs> <laughs> At least for me, when I'm really slowing down, I get clarity a lot faster and I always oh, yeah. remind yeah. myself that. Of that I mean, if you think it's just like overload of information constantly, right? And it's like, just to be able to put a pause on it and be like, what do I actually want to digest here? What do I actually yeah, yeah, want to take in? Exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah. All right, you know, well, I see that we're a little over time. So thank you for hanging out. And thank you, everybody for hanging out for that. Thank you very minutes. much. Kyle. Do you want to close with anything? 
And maybe where, if you have anything online where people can find you at or any upcoming events. Sure. I just want to say thank you. I'm very excited and grateful to be part of Vital and Likewise. just for us to keep having these conversations. And yeah, you can check me out on Instagram, Dr. Ido Cohen, or Day Integration Circle um, also. And feel free to reach out for questions or anything else. Um, we do our occasional workshops. <clears throat> And obviously, yeah, in providing individual and group preparation, integration, um, and long-term care for those who are interested. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Dr. Ido Cohen, thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in to mm -hmm. our psychedelic conversation here today. Um, any questions, comments, anything like that, feel free to send us an email, info at psychedelicstay.com. Um, and again, just some reminders, if you haven't subscribed to the show, be sure to do so. And I think that is it for today. So thank you, everybody. I'm wishing you well whenever you're listening to this and hope you have a beautiful week ahead. And we'll catch you next time on Psychedelics Today. So take care. Thank you.